After listening to the past speaker, the past 20 speakers in these two days, I'm full of rage. But I will not get a gun and fight. Because that's what the UN is waiting for to come and rescue us. I'll use my words to break down the systems of oppression in my country, in Africa, and around the world. Listening to the past 20 speakers today has given me more hope. It has made me stronger. It has given me more reason as to why I need to stand up. It has just proved me more right that dissidents are not cowards. But there are people who still want to continue to fight the, for their communities, who still want to see this world a better place. And the only way they can do that is to be in a free world. Leaving their countries does not mean that they are cowards. It means they want to still be alive and fight for freedoms. It means they are very aware that you're a better activist alive than dead. So. For me, sitting here these two days and listening to all these powerful people is a challenge. It's a challenge to all of us, a challenge to all the world leaders next door, but it's also a challenge for me. And I'm used to challenge, because where I come from, my life is a challenge. I come from a very beautiful small country in the East African part of the world, Uganda, with a population of about 33 million. By 2005, there was approximately 500,000 lesbian, gays, bisexual, and transgender people in my country. Right now in my country, to be a homosexual, you could face life imprisonment. This is not the only country in Africa. About 39 organizations in Africa criminalize homosexual acts. Only one country in Africa, one of the countries that has the most progressive laws and constitutions in the world, outlaws homosexual acts. But before even I speak about my country, Uganda, I would like to share with you about South Africa. I got a chance to live in South Africa for two years because, again, I needed a safe space from my country, from the oppression. I was going through, I decided to go for two years in South Africa, not only to run away from the oppression in my country, but also to learn on how to operate in a hostile environment. And South Africa being an African country that legalized homosexual acts, I decided to go there. My dear friends, my dear colleagues, South Africa, a country that's supposed to be a leading example on the continent, is one of the countries that you would not want to live in, especially as a gay person or a transgender person. Every week, a reported case of rape in South Africa. People are being murdered. People are being raped. This is, this is all over sub-Sahara Africa. I don't know how many times I've escaped rape. People have threatened to rape me, to cure me of my lesbianism. People have chased after me in broad daylight to teach me how to be a proper woman. My colleagues, my people, my community that I've given hope, I've encouraged to stand out of the closets. Cases every day are coming in of how people were harassed in the night, how people were sexually abused, how people were attacked. But South Africa, where this is all over the media, where it is reported in the news, in print media, on TV, the government is silent. The government that is supposed to be showing an example to the whole of Africa is silent about this. And I look and I wonder, is the UN waiting for a million lesbians to be raped in South Africa for them to declare a no zone area in South Africa like they're doing in other parts of the world? Are they waiting for every war against humans to be with guns?
for them to have emergency meetings like they did earlier this year about Libya. Not all wars in the world are about guns. The war women are facing in DRC Congo is sexual war on their bodies, sexual violence on their bodies. Not every war is about going to the bush. The war we are facing as LGBT people in the world does not need us to go on the streets with machine guns. The war the government is having against my community is not a ceasefire war. The war they are having is denying us access to health. The war they are having is expelling us from schools. The war the government right now is having with my community is introducing a death penalty because they believe life imprisonment is very weak a law. They want to stop me from going back to the media and say, look people, let us live in peace. That is a threat to them. They want to stop that from happening. And the only way they think they can stop that from happening is introducing the death penalty. That is a war on my community. When my country was signing to become a member of the United Nations, it promised, it agreed to abide by all the articles of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. But up to now they say gay rights are not human rights. Why didn't they raise that question before they signed the declaration? Why didn't they raise it? When we are voting in my country, the government does not say that they do not need gay votes. They do not. But why is it that the people we put in power to protect us are the people who are oppressing us? Late last year, a newspaper article appeared with suspected homosexuals with a big title they're after your children, hang them. Our pictures appeared. They even quoted most of us. People's workplaces were exposed, their families. But no one came out to hold this paper accountable and say you're inciting virus. You're exposing people's addresses, their pictures. No one did that. And this is the time we stood up and said, enough is enough. This cannot go on. Because people every day were having cases that they were being thrown out of their homes. We decided to go to court. And we said, if the systems of justice this time fail us, we are going to go wherever it takes. We won the court case on the 3rd of January this year. My colleague David, who was with me in the lawsuit, two weeks after lost his life. He was brutally murdered in cold blood. His picture was on the front page, under the title, Hang Them. The damage was already caused. We won the court case, but the damage was already caused. But as soon as David's death was announced, the government was the first to come out openly, even before the suspect was arrested, even before investigation started, and said it was not a hate crime. Before anything could be done, even before we could lay David to rest, the government came out and said it was not a hate crime. These are people who are supposed to tell everyone not to talk about the case until investigations are concluded. They arrested the suspect two days later. And the suspect came out and said exactly what the media said and what the government had said. What did they expect? This is someone out there who knows that he has a lot of support behind him. What did they expect? These are some just of the cases. After David's death, 28 people had to be 
relocated from their houses. I had to be taken out of the country with the help of human rights organizations for safety reasons. My house was broken into. Nothing was touched, not even a cushion removed from its place. What were they looking for if there were robberies? I returned home after two weeks. Two days after coming back home, my landlord says, I don't want you in my house. I ask why. She says, I just don't want you in my house. No reason, nothing. She gave me back my money. As if that was not enough, my office was attacked after being evicted. In two weeks, my office was evicted, my house was evicted. We get a new office. Before even we can settle in, they rob us. They came and took all our documents, all our computers, printers. They did not touch the money. They did not touch the fridge, the TV. But they took all our documents and came with a jerry can of acid. If they had found someone in office, would have lost that person. They came to rob. But they came with acid. We called on police that very night, and police refused until we put pressure. We talked to our international partners. We talked to people in the country we work with and told them police has refused to come. They came when even I think the, most of uh, the evidence was already distorted. Because media was coming in, everyone wanted to see what was happening. These are the systems that are supposed to protect us. And then we stand here. They are seated there. And we think they care about us. It's about oil in that room. We cannot afford to keep lying. It's about nuclear weapons in that room. Why is it the United Nations calling for an emergency meeting for what is happening in China. Where have they been for 42 years to start now panicking about Gaddafi? Where have they been when they were electing Libya in all these UN systems? Do they want to tell us that they didn't know? This much, those who are the UN, like some of um, some shared yesterday. We were harassed. A place where you're supposed to go and feel that you're protected. We were harassed by the African group. My colleagues and I were even standing outside, and one of the delegations from Uganda came and threatened us and said, do you know you could be arrested for treason? Because we are saying the truth. Yesterday in the newspapers back home, the government has threatened to ban international human rights organization. Yesterday, an Amnesty International has appeared on the list. Human Rights Watch has appeared on the list because they are afraid on everyone who is telling the truth that is on the ground. This is what they are trying to stop. That bill, should it go through and become a law, I would be arrested for standing here. I would be arrested. Because they do not want the world out there to know what exactly is happening on the ground. But I've said, I'm not going to give up. What I did, six weeks ago, I called for a press conference. Called the media, a lot of media, and launched a campaign, a national-wide campaign. And told the nation, the politicians, hate no more. Hate no more. We are here to share our stories, forgive testimonies, and we sent a very clear message to them that we are de not demanding for extraordinary rights. We are not de demanding for special rights. We are demanding for what was robbed away from us by the state, by the penal code, and the constitution of Uganda. Freedom and dignity. And do you know what happened? 
There's a campaign now counter attacking our campaign. There's a petition in parliament right now by the religious leaders, by politicians. They launched a campaign in the same room where we launched a campaign. And they're calling on parliament to pass the anti-homosexuality bill because they said we are promoting. But who is behind all this? Why is it that over the years we've been campaigning for gay rights in Uganda, it has not been escalating like in the past two years? It's because of our dear friends, the Americans. The Americans, yes. Who came to Uganda with their agenda that has failed in the United States? And because they have some good dollars, they said to take advantage of a small nation like Uganda. They came and took advantage of the poor religious people in my country and brainwashed them with their dollars and told them how homosexuals have come to take over Uganda, how they've come to destroy the traditional family. And they are having links with the family of the United Nations, I mean of the United States. Our dear friends in America have been very helpful. The president has come out openly to condemn the bill. Ms. Clinton has spoken to the president directly. But yesterday, President Obama said that statements and resolutions are not enough. Are not enough to clear issues, to solve issues. And I want to tell you, we need all your support in Uganda. Statements may not be enough, but President Obama's statement has helped us in the last two years for the bill to be shelved. So it may not work for some cases, but in other cases it works. And in my case in Uganda, statements of pressure to my government are working. Please continue bringing them in. Continue supporting us, even financially, because the government came out openly and said that they do not have funds. They acknowledge that there's a high percentage of HIV in the gay community, but they do not have funds to cater for them. So we are not including the national HIV AIDS policies. It's only us who have to go out there and look for funds to be able to help our own community. So we need the support even of finances. But what is my dream? I share the same dream with all the past 20 speakers and the other speakers that are going to speak today. It's a challenge for me, and my dream is a challenge. Who holds the United Nations accountable for its negligence? Where is it when gays and lesbians in Iran are being hurt? Where is it when transgender people in South America are being murdered? Where is it when lesbians in Africa are being raped? Why aren't they holding our governments accountable? In my government, it took 27 guns in five years to take over a very powerful regime of Obote, the National Ruling Resistance Movement, which is ruling now. But it has taken them 27 years with all the resources from the United Nations, from all over the world, to end the war in northern Uganda. I will not talk more about that. 27 guns in five years to take over a regime. 27 years with all the resources, with a million, over a million guns, and you can't take over a war in a small part of your country. United Nations has 193 countries, and about 80 of these countries criminalize homosexuals simply for being who they are. Yet these homosexuals are their doctors, their nurses, their children, 
and they are voters. But they sit next door, and none of them tells the other, why are you doing this to homosexuals? I don't believe that the nations is really bothered about human rights. I really do not believe that. If they did, they would know that the oil they are talking about is refined by human beings. And so the human beings need to be protected. But they are not. Who holds the United Nations accountable for its negligence? That's the dream I want to, to have, to find a person who can hold the Human Rights Council of the UN accountable for the sleepless nights people are having, for people who are even trying to commit suicide because they cannot take it anymore. Four months ago, I lost a colleague who committed suicide because it was too much. Four months ago. Thank you.